Hello, today we have a Hamilton Beach Model G mixer slash juicer that has operated for decades and decades and now it needs some service. We're using it and started to see some smoke come out of it. I've already done a little bit of work on it until I realized that it was worth uh, making a video on, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit and bring you guys up to speed. So this is a hand mixer that also fits on a stand. We can get the stand out of the way because we're just working on the mixer today. And I have found a few things that we needed to take a look at. First thing with these mixers is they have what's called a universal motor and it has brushes. Now they don't look anything like a, a, a paintbrush or a wire brush. They are these little carbon brushes here. So these are new ones I picked up at the hardware store. There is a standard 3 16 inch square carbon brush and they go underneath these white caps on each side. So the first thing I checked was these brushes. So I pulled the cap off, pulled the spring out, and what I got out of it was this little tiny stub. That is all that was left of the brush on this side and you can see how long it's supposed to be. So that brush is shot. The other side was even worse. The little tiny stub that was left was stuck in there and I had to pick it out with a pick. So you definitely have to have new brushes, but there's more to it than that. I'll get the caps and the springs out just so that they're out of the way because we're going to end up taking this whole thing apart. Underneath is a cover where we can access the wiring. Make sure I'm still on frame. So underneath this cover, I found a couple surprises. There are some capacitors and there are more brushes underneath this cover. Anyone that knows anything about old radios will recognize these wax and paper capacitors. And anyone that knows anything about old radios, they use the same ones. These things have to be replaced. If you see these in anything, they have to go. This is actually cracked and blown open. And I think the smoke that we were seeing came out of one of these capacitors. Now, the wiring here is damaged very badly. Yes. And we found out it was damaged when we were just checking it out because we thought it would be nice to replace it. Mm -hmm. But then... Yeah, so see all that bare wire here? That insulation just fell right off the wire when we touched it earlier. So it wasn't even a pull or a push, it was just a tap. Oh yeah, and it just fell apart. So we need to replace this whole line cord, which is no big deal. We'll throw a new line cord on it, and that's all the wiring that's bad. The wiring going down into the motor is probably going to be okay. And the capacitors will have new wires, so that won't be a big deal. But the other surprise is, it's hard to see on camera. So we can get a little bit of light in here. Make sure this is in frame. Let me zoom down in here. There are brushes down inside of this that I was not expecting to find. So if I can hold this capacitor out of the way, right there, Right there, those are brushes. They're still in good condition. We pulled those out earlier. They look fine. There it is. We can reuse these. No big deal. But I don't know why there's brushes in there because on universal motors like this, let's zoom out a little bit. The brushes on the side are the main brushes that carry the current through the motor. So power goes in the line cord. This is a resistor up here to control the speed. So the power goes from the line cord through the resistor, through one brush, through the motor windings, the uh, rotor windings, out the other brush and out the line cord. That's all you have to have for most universal motors. So I was really surprised to find these brushes inside. So we have a few things to do to this. We need to figure out what these brushes do, what, these, what the function is of these capacitors, they're marked 115 volts AC and they have a part number, but they do not say what their capacitance is. So we need to figure out 
what these capacitors do, what their function is in the circuit, so we know how to replace them. And I also want to figure out what these brushes are doing down inside. Okay, so I want to see if we can take this motor apart. And the first thing I'm going to do is take the other brush out of the inside. I took the first one out earlier. So there's the whole brush and assembly. And then there are three screws. Get this in shot, there we go. There are three screws in the front of this housing and the handle. I'm not sure how many of those have to come out, but we're going to start taking screws out and see what happens. Okay, I took all three screws out and let's see if this comes apart. We can gently pry right here. There we go. And we're very carefully. Yeah, take it apart like that. This is the gearbox. This is actually grease, which is okay. I'm happy to see this. And there is the remnants of a cork gasket right around here. We'll have to cut a new cork gasket for it when we put it back together. So this is the gearbox. In fact, some of that cork fell down inside. That's part of the gasket. So we'll set that aside and keep going. Okay, to get this front shell off, there are two nuts. There's one, and you have to have a pretty thin wall 930 seconds socket. This is an SK socket, and it fits perfectly. So hopefully we can get this front cover off. It's like that. There we go. So there's the front cover, and then this is the speed control. Look at it right here. It's got various speeds and what you are supposed to mix with those speeds, apparently. There's also a bushing that just came out, a fiber bushing. That was in there. So we'll save that bushing. Um, Nelson, I might um, yeah. show the camera. Mm -hmm. Sure. So most of the time you won't see this, I don't think. Uh, actually, now that I think about it, it looks right. like it might be visible, but anyway. Yeah. If it's hard to see at all, here. There it we is. go. Yeah, that's kind of cool. So you can pause this and yep. read that again. But um, let's put this back. And you can see that through this window right here. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to see what comes out and what doesn't. Because if something doesn't come out, that means. It's it's um, screwed into something or clipped into place yeah. or held by something at least that well, we can try to find. This has a couple of wires attached to it because this is part of that speed control. I'm hoping I can just set that aside for the moment. I don't want to unhook this if I don't have to until we're ready. Mm -hmm. There is a little bushing right there. I want to make sure we save that. This just covers these contacts that are further inside. There we go. I'll use my screwdriver and point to these. There's a contact right there, and then a contact right down here. By this point, we can pull the whole rotor out. I feel that it's loose. So I'm very gently moving the rotor. Now, mm -hmm. if you look closely, you can see that there are there is some wiring here. Mm -hmm. This wiring is all okay though. Yeah. There isn't really much we can do with this. Mm -hmm. That See, and if we did try to replace it, it would practically be buying a whole new yeah. one of these because we cannot make that. I see those dimples right there. Those are drill marks where this rotor was balanced at the factory. So they build it and then they spun it on a machine and they found that to make this balance they had to drill out just a little bit of material right there. That's kind of cool. This is called the commutator. So this is where the main brushes, right there, they ride on that commutator. That doesn't look too bad, but that darkness, that's pretty normal. We can clean that up with some scotch bright. I'm going to show the camera a little bit better. Mm-hmm, sure. You have to dip a little further away from the lens. 
So it can there focus. Go. There we go. Now I've shown these, uh, this commutator right here. So that is where the second set of inside brushes, let me see if I have them handy. That's where these brushes ride, is on those contacts, that commutator. So normally it would move like this slightly, I think. Yep, it would spin. I don't remember which direction it spins. So I'm still trying to figure out what this whole mechanism right here is. From this point back, this is just a regular motor. This is pretty common stuff. But I don't know what this does. I've never seen this before. Now it's easy enough to clean these contacts. We can just open those up and run a contact file through them um, because they're pitted. It's, I realize it's hard to see on camera, but there is pitting, especially in this contact. We can clean those easy enough. But I don't know what this does, and I want to know what that does so I know what value of capacitor to install. Okay, let's see if we can look at this capacitor. This actually looks like two capacitors in one. I wonder if it was two capacitors. Oh, I see what this does. Okay, this is cool. We can replace this easy enough. So the two wire nuts go right to the line cord, which we're going to replace anyways, so we can take these two wire nuts off. Now these are special high temperature ceramic wire nuts. They're pretty common in motors and light fixtures. So here's the line cord right here, and we have one going to this wire nut, one going to this wire nut. And then these wires go right down inside to connect to the motor. But they also go to this capacitor. So we have three legs in this capacitor. One leg right here goes to one side of the line cord. This leg goes to this side of the line cord. And the third leg right here goes to this screw on the case of the unit. This is to reduce electromagnetic noise electromagnetic interference from the brushes inside of the unit and it connects the case it's kind of a quasi ground to connect the case of the unit to the line cord uh, this would never meet safety standards today if you do something like this you have to use a special capacitor that's rated to connect between line and ground but I think the solution here is we've got to replace this cord anyways well, let's just replace this cord with a three-wire cord that has a ground, and we can eliminate this whole capacitor. We don't even need this. We'll just run the ground wire from the line cord right to that screw, and we're good. See, back in the old days, there wasn't a lot of grounded receptacles in people's houses. Most receptacles only had a hot and a neutral. They didn't have a ground connection. So that's why equipment always had to have just two prongs. But nowadays, most houses have three-wire service, including mine. So this can just come right out. And we'll put in a three-wire cord. There it is. Don't need it anymore. This is a safety hazard nowadays because if one of these lines shorted to this, it would put high voltage right on the outside of the unit. Or if this shorted internally, it would create a short circuit when you plug this in. So these are no good. Okay, we took a look at this off camera and found a couple things that are noteworthy. There's some evidence of uh, arcing or heat damage right here. This plate looks a little burnt. Trying to get that to show up. So it slightly makes sense why there was smoke that one time. Yeah. Now, I don't think this is going to be a problem, but we'll just keep that in the back of our minds. And we'll try not to break this because this is probably pretty fragile right here right now. Other thing that I see is right here that connection. So the wire you see going off to the right goes to the capacitor and this is the brush holder but then this wire right here is part of this resistance winding for the power switch. And that is connected to this capacitor somehow. Well it's connected to this capacitor but I can't figure out what the equivalent circuit is in the motor. So what I want to do is unsolder this capacitor and test it again. Okay, we'll take this capacitor out and testing it out of circuit we finally get a good reading. Now we're getting 235 nanofarads. That's a good value. We can work with that. Assuming that it hasn't changed in value because of its age, 
But I'll look through my collection and find a capacitor that's reasonably close to that, and we'll put it in service. And here's the new capacitor I'm going to use. This is a little different than the old one. This looks like a typical wax capacitor that you can find in a radio, and basically it is. But this is designed to have AC current flowing through it um, at a little bit higher current than you'd find in a radio. In a radio, that capacitor would be used to couple relatively small signals between different stages in a radio or to bypass unwanted RF to ground. And that's what this capacitor is here. This is a little 0.22 microfarad capacitor you'd use in a radio. These aren't designed to have a motor current flowing through them. Typically for a purpose like this you'd use a motor run capacitor. The problem is I can't find a motor run capacitor that's this small. This small in value or this small in size. So I'm going to try this capacitor. We'll see if it works. This capacitor does have an AC rating, an AC voltage rating. Well, I can give you the specs on this if you uh, want. Just ask me down in the comments. So we're going to try it. It'll probably be fine because this is a pretty low current motor. But that could still be a point of failure. And I've put together a schematic to help me understand what's going on here. So on the left hand side is the power, power cord, power plug. So power comes in and it goes through the power switch which is that half moon contact plate that we saw earlier. Anytime the switch is in any of the positions other than off, this contact plate uh, is completing the circuit through one of the main brushes. And those are the bigger brushes, these, that we find on the side of the mixer. Goes through the armature of the motor, through the motor windings, and then through these secondary brushes that ride on those slip rings that we saw earlier. And that's one of those brushes. And then we have this big mess. I'll get back to this in a minute. Let's ignore all of this, because then we have the stator winding, and then back to the power cord. So I'll zoom back out and see if I can show you this. I realize the writing is small, but just give me a second here. Forget about all of this and those secondary brushes. If you just look at the power path between the power cord, the power switch, through the armature, through the stator winding, that's just a typical universal motor wiring diagram. Now we'll get back to this mess up here. This is part of the speed control system. Hopefully that's in focus. Okay. When the motor is has stopped, or if it's running at a slow speed, these contacts right here are closed. When those contacts are closed, these components are out of circuit. They're bypassed. So you can forget about these components right here. When those are closed, we just have a straight path through the stator winding. These secondary brushes just ride on slip rings and there's nothing in the motor that connects to the slip rings that these secondary brushes ride on. They are just a short circuit. And I'll get back to that once we uh, take a look at the armature again. So consider this just a short circuit. Forget that these brushes are even here. So that's a short circuit and when these contacts are closed here, that's a short circuit. So we have a plain power path from the power plug through the stator winding, through the armature, and it's simple. But once this gets up to speed, there must be some mechanism that will open these contacts. And I can kind of see how it works, but I can't completely understand how it works. So I, I hope this is helpful. I just can't fully explain how the speed control works. I was expecting a variable resistor, but there, there are no variable resistors in this mixer. So when these contacts open, now you have current flowing through this 200 ohm resistor. And we saw that earlier, but I'll, I'll point it out again in a minute. That's the wires that are wound around and around inside of the mixer. And forget about the capacitor for the, for the moment. Most of the power is flowing through that resistor. 
and through the stator winding. My best guess is that capacitor just reduces arcing on these contacts as these contacts open and close. Just like a condenser on a point system in an older car if you're familiar with how points work in older vehicles. That's my guess is the same thing that's going on here. That's why I feel okay about using one of these little radio capacitors because I don't think a whole lot of current is going to flow through that capacitor. I could be wrong, but I think we're okay. So now that we understand what's happening, let's dig back into the mixer and see if I can point out a few of these components. Inside here is the 200 ohm resistor that I was talking about earlier. And this is that contact plate that I mentioned. So when the power switch is in any of the on positions, it just makes contact with these metal strips. When it's off, it's over here not making contact. We'll set that aside for a minute and here are those armature contacts that I was talking about that we saw earlier. They're normally closed like they are now, but sitting on top of them is this piece which needs to be cleaned because there's quite a bit of carbon buildup in here. And this engages like this. So that when pressure is applied to this plate, the movement is small, but if you look real close, that contact is opening. And what puts pressure on that is this, the speed control. It goes together something like this. And you can see this plate here, these are angled and so the further you turn the speed control, the more pressure it applies to this plate right here. And the more likely it is to open those contacts. Apparently as the motor runs, it must pull the motor in slightly, and that counteracts the force of this spring to maintain a variable speed. If you have a better way to explain it, let me know, but uh, that's the basics of how this works. So getting back to maintenance, we'll clean these slip rings, we'll clean the commutator, and I'm going to clean the inside of this. All of this stuff could come out, but I really don't want to take this any further apart than necessary because I don't want to disturb anything in here that might be fragile. So I'm going to go inside with the rag and clean out as much of this carbon buildup as I can and clean the outside of the unit. These are my greasy fingerprints I've put on it. I've done some testing with some uh, Goo Gone, and Goo Gone seems to work really well. Of course, I've already got it dirty again. But I'll go over this whole case with some Goo Gone and clean this up on the outside. And then it's just a matter of putting things back together. I'm going to clean this out with some contact cleaner. I realize it's kind of hard to see on cameras. I have the Gain turned up all the way because I'm trying to show the inside of this motor housing. I've used some compressed air, compressed air to try to blow some of this carbon goo out, but it's gooey. It's not just carbon dust. So that's where this contact cleaner really shines. See how it just dissolves it? It's like that. So I'm going to hose it out inside with some contact cleaner. Got a garbage can below me catching what comes out. But that is the way to clean this if you don't take it all apart. This just dissolves that carbon buildup very nicely. Now I'm on to cleaning the contacts on the armature and these are pretty easily cleaned with a gentle point file. One of these contacts really wasn't bad at all. So I'm just taking the file and running it back and forth through those contacts on each side. This side is really rough and pitted. 
This will need quite a bit of work, but it'll clean up. One thing I did not explain very well when I was showing you the schematic diagram is how these contacts and slip rings are connected. One side of the contact plate is connected to one slip ring and the other side of the contact plate is connected to the other slip ring. So these two slip rings just serve to carry current through these contacts and back into the shell of the, of the motor. That just allows these contacts to spin with the armature. So before I said these are basically a short circuit, when you're looking at this on the diagram from a theoretical standpoint, you can ignore these and just consider them a short circuit. But actually what they are is, is different sides, or each side of the contacts are one of these two slip rings. Hope that makes more sense. On these slip rings and on the commutator, I'm just taking a scotch Bright pad and just going back and forth on these carefully and it's cleaning them up very nicely. If I had a lathe I could spin this in, it would be even better, but I don't, so I'm just doing this. They're polishing up just fine. I cleaned the outside of the case as best as I could. I was trying to balance the des my desire to clean it with uh, being careful to not damage the existing paint. So some of this stuff I'm not going to be very aggressive with. I'm just going to leave it as is. But it cleaned up pretty well. And more importantly is all the electrical contacts. So I used some very fine steel wool and polished those contacts and the corresponding contacts on here. That's all cleaned up. All the carbon that I could get out of here is cleaned out. You want to get any carbon debris out of the motor that you can because carbon is conductive and it can lead to short circuits. And that's probably what happened right here. You get what's called carbon tracking where enough carbon built up between this contact and, and the case that it uh, actually drew an arc. Hopefully with that uh, cleaned up that won't happen again but I'll keep an eye on that. Armature is reinstalled and now it's just a matter of putting all these pieces back together. Before I put the armature in I drip some of this 3-in-1 motor oil down into the bearing in the bottom. And I'll do the same thing up here up at the top wherever it went. And this, there's a oil felt I showed earlier. I'll make sure that's good and oily because that's really dry right now. And now it's just a matter of putting everything back together. This was all covered in carbon dust. That cleaned up very nice. And just in case you happen to have lost these when you took, it, took yours apart, if you're following along at home, there are two washers or bushings right here. There's a thicker washer that goes on the bottom and then a thinner metal washer on top. These are very important washers because this is the thrust washer that makes contact with this. So once this is engaged, that is a bearing surface right there. I got a little ahead of myself. Before we install the armature and all this stuff, we need to solder in the new capacitor. I could solder it in right now, but it's a lot easier to install that before the armature is in place. I'm going to pull this back apart and we'll put that new capacitor in. Just for the fun of it, I stripped the insulation off from the old capacitor's wires and installed an installation on the wires of this capacitor so that they don't touch anything inside of the motor. There's the capacitor. Originally it sat in this compartment, but the leads were a little bit shorter on this one, and because the capacitor is small enough, it fit right here just fine. So if you see inside where it's soldered, there's the insulated wires, and it is bent over just so it would fit in that compartment. Now we can reinstall the armature contact plate and work on the front end. The inside front cover is back on and I wiped off all the excess grease that I could. I made sure to align the oil port with the one on the back. I cleaned up the mix guide window and reinstalled that. And now you can see through there how that works. That looks very nice. 
And there is our new capacitor. And next thing I'll do is install those inside brushes. There's enough room to slip those in. And we can install the outside brushes. With the outside brushes, you have to make sure that they go in the correct direction because they have a slight curve to them from the factory and that curve has to match the uh, curve of the commutator when they're installed. The next thing I want it to do is scrape out as much of this old grease as I can out of this cover. Scrape it out. I'm not going to go hog wild trying to clean every bit of it out but I'm at least going to scrape out what I can and replace it with some similar consistency grease. This feels about like wheel bearing grease and I have a bunch of that so that's what I'm going to use. Should be just fine. When we're reinstalling the front cover it's helpful to install the beaters because of how these beaters interlock they have to be oriented properly when this cover is reinstalled because the shaft of the motor is what links these two beaters together inside the front cover. So I'm going to see if I can hold these so that they're as equally spaced as I can and then push it on something like this. I'm not real thrilled with that. That's pretty good. I think I might pull it back off and see if I can move it just one notch. Okay, now these beaters are set up such that they can't touch each other when they're running. We'll reinstall the three screws in the front cover and then get back to the wiring. For a replacement power cord, I'm going to use one of these computer cords with an IEC power connector on the end. Because I have dozens of these. Every time you buy a new computer, they come with a new cord. And of course, I always save the old cords when I discard anything. So I have a bunch of these. So we can just cut this end off and wire this into our mixer. This particular one seems to have about the same outside diameter as the original cord. So here's the original one, and it's about the same size, and this has a grounding connector. So it should be able to feed this in through the back of the mixer like this. I'll strip the wires first. We can feed it into the back of the mixer and then hook it up. Before I feed that wire in, I want to crimp a ring terminal onto the end of this wire for the ground and then I'll just start to strip these wires a little bit just because it's easier out here. And then these should all fit through the back of the mixer. And then they have to go around this little loop, which is kind of a trick. But they go in like that, and that's how the cord is secured around that pin. I don't like making that severe of a bend in a wire, but that's the way it's done. So now we have the two wires going into the motor and our little ground wire. Let's hook this up next. Polarity should not matter. Doesn't matter which wire goes to the white and which goes to the black. And we have lots of room to tuck those in out of the way. Now we can reinstall the bottom cover. I'll finish by reinstalling the nameplate and the handle, which still has to be cleaned up a little bit. Our mixer is back together. I've plugged it in. Let's turn it on and see what happens.
Seems to work. I'll let it run for a while at various speeds and just make sure there isn't any unusual heating or funny noises. A little bit of smoke actually wouldn't concern me too much because that resistor inside, especially in the lower settings, is going to get pretty hot and any debris or dust that might be on that resistor could make some smoke. Uh, as long as it goes away, I'm not too worried about it. But I think this will be just fine. This is kind of cool. If you look down inside, you can see those points opening and closing and arcing as they do. I don't know if that's good or not. I'm not real worried about it. I'll keep an eye on those contacts. But if I turn it on low, you'll see those, those contacts arcing as they're opening and closing rapidly to vary the speed. If I go full speed, it'll probably stop arcing. but at the lower speeds. They're arcing just a little bit. I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? If you have experience working on motors like this, let me know. I'd really be curious if that's normal or not. Like I say, I'm not real worried about it. Otherwise, this seems to be working just fine.